Good afternoon. I'd like to uh, welcome you to our seventh presentation in the noon lecture series at the Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies. And I have uh, two announcements. The next presentation in this lecture series will be uh, on November 17th and will be given by Yi Ching Wu, Associate Professor at the Department of East Asian Studies at the University of Toronto. And he will be speaking on, is it possible to de mauify the Cultural Revolution? This evening at the Michigan Theater, we will be presenting the third offering in Also Like Life, the films of Ho Xiaoxian at the Michigan Theater. This is a screening of Flowers of Shanghai, which will take place at 6 p.m. in the screening room of, of the theater. Uh, on Wednesday evening, there will be a, a double feature, uh, which will close the series. There'll be a screening of Good Men, Good Women at 5 p.m. And at 7 p.m., a screening of Millennium Mambo. And both of those are also in the screening room. And this series is free and open to the public. We would appreciate it if you could take time to turn off your cell phones before our talk begins. Today's presentation will be given by Meg Rithmeyer, Assistant Professor in the Business, Government, and International Economy Unit at Harvard Business School, where she teaches in the MBA required curriculum. She earned her PhD in government from Harvard in 2011, and her work has been published in World Politics and China Quarterly, and she just published a book called Land Bargains and Chinese Capitalism. Today she will be speaking on land and Chinese capitalism. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Everyone can hear me okay? Yes. Is this on? Sorry. Is that better? Okay, good. That won't happen again. Um, so thanks for having me. Um, it's a lot of fun to be at Michigan. Is this, it's, it's still not really. Hmm? No, it's off. Yeah, it's off. Maybe I'll just speak. It should be over here. I see this one's off right there. This one's off. That's just the light. Interesting. Oh, is this one? that one on or something? Sorry. This is the mic. Yes. And that says it's off, so yeah. let's just turn it down. Yeah. Okay, great. I'll just try to speak a little okay. softer than I normally, I normally have a loud voice and don't use microphones, so this will be the opposite of what I normally do. Um, and if, it's okay? Okay, great, sorry. Um, so it's really, it's, it's exciting to be here. Um, I think Fine. So maybe the, I'll just try not, I'll try to wonder less than I normally do. Um, so it's nice to be here. I'm coming from Harvard where I did my PhD and now teach at the business school, although I'm a political scientist, but it's always nice to be in Michigan, which I think is one of like the meccas of Asian studies. So, um, so this is sort of like a, a pilgrimage, <laughs> I, th I think, in many ways. Um, so I, as, um, as Professor Gallagher said, I just uh, published a book with Cambridge University Press called Land Bargains and Chinese Capitalism. And in the tradition of people who have just published books, I'm also a little tired of talking about it, <laughs> um, which is unfortunate for you because if you want to um, actually learn about exactly what's in the book, you'll have to go read it. Um, but I will give a talk today that's, of course, related to land and Chinese capitalism, related to some of the themes in the book, but mostly. to these topics, but not exactly the findings that are in the book. Um, and so I'm happy to have you interrupt me with um, clarifying questions at any point. I teach MBA students at Harvard, so um, you can try me. But um, And then I'll leave plenty of time at the end for, for questions. Um, so um, in the interest of uh, clarifying exactly what the problem is, um, I want to start out by talking about land and, and basically argue that land is China's most fundamental economic problem and its most fundamental political problem. Many of you in the audience are going to be familiar with these dynamics and will not be surprised by this, but let me just try to convince you nonetheless. Um, so these are images of the city of Ordos, which many of you have probably heard of, if not been to. Um, Ordos is a city in, literally in the middle of the desert in Inner Mongolia and has become quite famous as being maybe the most extreme of what's called ghost cities in China. So cities that have all of the 
infrastructural and architectural trappings of a modern city, save the people. Here you see, you know, some very elaborate villa construction up here in the upper right, um, some other apartment buildings. Um, there's also um, very avant-garde libraries with no books, um, avant-garde performance centers that have never hosted plays in the city of Ordos. And everyone loves Ordos, you know, it's in the middle of the desert. There's no one there. It's a very dramatic example of a ghost city. Um, and in my view, it sort of works on a logic that's different from a lot of the other ones. This is that it's a mining town where there was so much money and so so few places to put it, right? But we also see um, this kind of uh, pathology all over China. So the top two photos are ones that I took. Um, I'm a terrible photographer, so I apologize, but um, that I took for in the city of Harbin. Um, one, a city that um, I work a lot on and the book has a long chapter on. Um, so this is just outside, this is an area called Hasi Harbin West, which is the new development direction of that city. And there were you know, maybe hundreds of these buildings with no people there and a bus station that was yet to be completed. But the whole idea was once this bus station is completed, then it'll be a new center of the city and everyone will move there. And the bottom is a screen capture from um, a special program, a special presentation on 60 Minutes about ghost cities in China that basically alerted everyone in the United States attention to this, um, to this thing, I started getting a lot of emails, which was nice and not nice. But in any case, this kind of thing happens all over China, outside of every major city. Um, not only that, but you see headlines like these all the time. So you know, these, you know, China is, you know, trying to curb mortgage lending, and then six months later, China is trying to encourage mortgage lending. And so Beijing constantly seems caught in the stance of trying to make sure that property that property prices stay high, that real estate and housing prices stay high. But that they don't grow so fast, right, that we hear things about property prices are out of control in China. Maybe there's a real estate bubble. Average members of the working class in most of China's first and second tier cities can't seem to afford housing. Um, and so we see this delicate dance between trying to make sure that real estate you know, stays um, healthy and strong, but not so strong that we start to think that there's a bubble with some economic or political consequences. So that's the, the economics of it. And the politics of it um, you know, are pretty clear to many of you as well. So I'll just show um, some, some data and then some images. So the, the principal thing that people associate with land right now is something called land finance, Sudi Taizong um, in Chinese, which is this phenomenon by which local governments rely primarily on the revenues that they generate from leasing out land, um, which they now control. They are the owners of urban land in China. Um, and they depend more on the revenue from land sales than they do on tax revenue, on budgetary revenue. So everyone has um, their shot at this data, and these data are not um, by any means um, bulletproof, just because, of course, local governments have incentives to hide how much money <laughs> they're generating from land lease revenues, right? But if you look at the column, I'll lose my laser pointer, um, this column over here, so this is how much um, they get from land lease revenues as a, per as a percentage, right, of their budgetary revenue. So here in 2010, so they're getting almost, this is in the aggregate, local governments in the aggregate are getting almost as much money from leasing out land annually than they do from taxes, right? Which any of you who are familiar with public finance just at a basic level, that's disturbing, right? Because this is not a continuous source of income. It's a one-shot source of income. Yes? Uh, so municipal governments. This is thinking about municipal governments. So um, at the city level, right, and the district level, not provincial level. Um, that's a little bit different, right? One level down between county and provincial. Exactly, yeah. When you say leasing the land, yeah. literally just renting it to a so, so land is still publicly owned in both rural and urban China. In rural China, it's, pub it's owned by the collective, right, which are these organizations of um, collective farmers. And in urban land, is owned by the state. So there's a leasehold system. So they lease out land um, for periods of 40 to 70 years based on the purpose of that land, industrial, commercial, or residential. And critically, those lease fees accrue to the local government that owns the land in one lump sum. So it's not <laughs> annualized, right, and it's not something they can depend on as a steady stream of income, but if you lease it out this year for the next 40 years, you get that in a lump sum. So you start to see, right, how the incentives work here. If that's what local governments depend on for their revenue, right, then they have very much have the incentive to appropriate more and more land, typically from the countryside, as they convert um, collectively owned land to public to, to state-owned land and then lease it out. So the consequences of that, um, so I promised some images rather than some data. So here you can see um, some of the more dramatic consequences, although these really aren't that dramatic. So you see these kinds of nail houses. This is a very famous one in the city of Chongqing. But you see these in almost every Chinese city and some Chinese villages. Um, then you see um, down here on the bottom left, 
So this is a city in Shanxi province in 2010 where residents of a village who refused to go along right, with the land compensation were paraded around with placards in the middle of the village. Um, I sometimes get to show this image to Chinese officials who are horrified by this for reasons many of you understand that it's very reminiscent of the Cultural Revolution in China, these kinds of tactics right, of trying to, um, to secure compliance. And then the top is the m perhaps the most famous, which is the city of Wukan in Guangdong province, which um, turned itself into a bit uh, something like a fortress, refusing to allow any officials in or out of the village until the provincial level um, actually dissolved the, the local government and allowed them to elect their own leaders. Right, And this was all conflict that began over land compensation and what was perceived as a land grab. Um, so we have this huge... Um, economic problem and a huge political problem, which led me, having looked at this for a long time, to think about this in terms of two puzzles. So one is um, the origin story. How did we get here? How did land come to be the center of the Chinese political economy? Um, and how, to, how over the past 30 years, how did that happen? So in the 1980s, there was no such thing as leasing out urban land for land lease revenues. And here, 30 years later, we have land as the primary thing that seems to run the Chinese public economy. So how did we get there? And the second is the more political puzzle, right, which is, I mean, this is the CCP, you know, is a, 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 the Chinese Communist Party, a party state that, you know, it can be credited for the most part at some times with many things with responding to the will of the people, especially responding to some things which give it a lot of problems, right? So in the 90s, the entire countryside was aflame with protests over the peasant burden. And in 2006, they eliminate the agricultural tax for the first time in a couple millennia, right? So, um, so given that it's the, the this huge source of problems, so 65 percent, um, Yu Jian Rong, China's foremost um, sociologist says, 65 percent of um, mass incidents in the countryside now concern land compensation and land grabs, right? So if it's that much of a political problem, then why has the CCP um, pursued, um, so sort of maintain these institutions which generate this problem, and in fact, even, even strengthen these institutions which generate this problem? So it seems to be a bit of a political puzzle. Um, so my answer to that, um, and so, but briefly, I'll bore you with some social science. So there's also a theoretical, a theoretical puzzle, um, which is in a comparative perspective, which is about the politics of macroeconomic management. So there's this, um, this literature in political science and political economy that looks at how states choose policies to manage the economy, right? And they vary. Even advanced capitalist democracies vary in this. Um, you know, in the United States, um, there's a turn from Keynesianism to monetarism at certain points, right? Whereas in certain Scandinavian countries, countries in Northern Europe, they use collective wage bargaining, right, so looking at wages, so thinking about the tools that, that governments use to manage business cycles and to direct aggregate demand in different ways. Um, and so, you know, in general, that, that research has come up with several hypotheses, you know, that it's about they do adopt certain tools because of their ideas about what those tools can do and new ideas lead them to adopt new tools. Um, that they're managing social conflict in certain ways, right? That this tool um, is, a, is, a, is a thing that benefits certain political coalitions. And I wanted to think in terms of China. You know, clearly, um, you know, these macroeconomic cycles were happening in China for a long period of time. And how is it that the CCP decides to manage the macroeconomy in this different way, as particularly as they transition from micro controls, so controls over prices, um, to these macro controls? Um, so, the two arguments that I'll, I'll make today um, are answers to these two puzzles. And I'll give you the, the brief one so you can fall asleep if you'd like to. But, um, so the first, so how did they, how did they adopt land um, as, the st as the center of, of the Chinese economy? And even saying adopting is a bit controversial, right? The literature, sen you know, some people seem to think that the pursuit of land conversion and land grabbing is an accidental consequence of, of the fiscal reorganization that China experienced. But I argue that the opposite is in fact true. That after a period of initial land liberalization in the late 1980s and early to mid 1990s, um, real estate overinvestment and China's first experience with a real estate bubble, which I'll detail for you, led the CCP to centralize control over the macro supply of land, but decentralized land ownership. Um, so it assigned local governments as the owners 
of urban land at the same time that they recentralized control over revenue burden, over, over tax revenues, right? So that in fact, um, this role of land, right, as a source of income for local governments was an intentional thing. And the direction of, of, of market change um, for land in China that in fact is the opposite of what we think. So a lot of times people think China's just having growing pains on its route to private property rights and its route to liberalization. And I find that the opposite's true. That in fact, land markets looked a lot more liberal in the late 1980s and early 1990s than they do now, and they were reversed as the process of choice. So this I'll call the land and recentralization hypothesis. And the second argument um, is, so how does, why, why has the CCP continued to strengthen these institutions? Well, I argue that they're using land and state control over land supply as an instrument of control over the macro economy. In fact, that they encourage real estate investment in a counter-cyclical way. And I'll show you some evidence for that. Um, so, and that's um, between this period of 1998 and 2010. And I'll talk about after 2010, hopefully, if I have time at the end of the talk. So that's the land and management hypothesis. Um, so here's the sort of outline for the rest of the talk. So I'll start by um, convincing you that this, this reorganization of land control and of fiscal institutions happen simultaneously to think of, to put land at the center of Chinese capitalism, and then talk about land and management, then go through some implications, and then again, if I have time, talk about the future of urbanization in China. Um, so land and recentralization. So, the, so many of you may be familiar with how land was used during the Maoist period, um, which was as a sort of input to production, right, that was, that was thought of as free. So land was given out to various state-owned enterprises or government organs basically for free. And when you get something for free, you tend to use it inefficiently, and that's exactly what happened in China. So um, all of, you know, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, there was um, a very lively policy debate, which I detail in part in the book about what should be done about this. Now that urban growth is proceeding, people are returning from the countryside where they had gone during the Cultural Revolution, and now there's a crisis in urban housing, um, there's mismanagement of urban land, and what should be done about this? Um, and so what actually happened between in, in the 1980s, especially through um, 1988, was this process from of thinking where the CCP went from thinking land as an input to production to something like a commodity, right? And they actually use that term, shampinghua, commodification of land between 1980 and 1992. And it required a change in mental models and a series of experiments, which is, again, pretty normal policy making in China. You try something in one city, you see how it works, and then you scale it up. And they did this under conditions of uncertainty. Um, and, and this is important because they didn't know what the outcome of these things would be, and they didn't even know what outcome they wanted, right? The idea was that they were experimenting with different models of managing land as a state resource um, and thinking about land and its role in the macro economy. And they would learn certain things from these different experiments and then reorganize how they thought about it. Um, so I like to start with um, this quote, which is one of my favorite things. Um, so this is from um, Zhao Ziyang's personal, um, his diaries. And he says, it was perhaps 1985 or 1986 when I talked to Ho Yingdong, and that's Henry Falk, the um, Hong Kong tycoon, and mentioned that we didn't have funds for urban development. He asked me, if you have land, how can you not have money? I thought this was a strange comment. Having land was one issue, a lack of funds was another. What did the two have to do with one another? <laughs> so as late as, I mean, you can argue that maybe Zhao Ziyang's putting us on just a little bit, but at least in the mid-1980s, it wasn't obvious to people at the very high, the very commanding heights of Chinese politics and of Chinese economic management, what role land would have, right? So we go from there, right, to in 1980, so a series of experiments that started in 1986 um, in different cities in China. First they charge land use fees and they sort of see how that would work. Um, and then they start in Shenzhen um, to start leasing out um, state-owned land. And they first start leasing it out to state-owned enterprises, right? Owners or, or leasers or uh, users who wouldn't be that threatening to local governments. And then in 1988, actually on August 8, um, 1988, so 8, 8, 1988, you know that 8 is auspicious in China. And they had a sense that what they were doing was a bit historical, historically important. They leased out the first piece of land in Hongqiao Development Zone in Shanghai um, to a foreign user, right? So this idea that, um, so they're going to th this major policy change from using land as a free input to something that generates capital. Um, so in 1986 was the first experiment. And, and curiously, in 1986, they published a land law in China that said land use rights may not be transferred to any party. And then in two years later, they changed that law to say, but land use, that land use rights can may be transferred according to law. That's all they said. Land use rights may be transferred according to law. 
They didn't designate who owns urban land or collective land, right? They didn't designate who the users could be, right? And in fact, as is the case with many Chinese policy changes, they sort of permitted, right, some uncertainty about what the law was, and then experiments bubbled up from below. Um, so there were at least 200 plus local regulations, provincial and prefectural and city level regulations about what land markets would look like, who was in the business of leasing, who to whom would these lease fees accrue. Um, a lot of these are on, um, in different places. Some of them at, are at the Harvard Law Library. A lot of overseas investors in Hong Kong and Taiwan were collecting these different local regulations to try to figure out what land markets were in every Chinese city. Um, and it generated, um, like many things do, right, some speculation and what was called an enclosure craze. Um, so um, what they meant by that enclosure craze was these different, these different users, right, or occupants of, of land in urban China enclosing little parts off and then using this new real estate market, right, to generate money for themselves. So who did this? Not just local governments, right, universities did this, hospitals did this, right, all kinds of government bureaucracies who, uh, who, were, who were occupying different parts of land and who were by extension parts of the state remember China at this point is a socialist country right who exactly the state is is a very wide definition right universities are the state right state-owned enterprises are the state so you see everybody getting into the business of real estate and making money through land, right? So lots of enterprises, again, universities start to make money through land. They get loans from local banks, which were decentralized at the time, to invest in these real estate projects to generate capital in ways that were very different from their normal business. And this was actually encouraged by the state. So there are all these publications from the Ministry of Construction saying, you know, this is a great thing. Land prices can only go up and not down. It's great that everyone's diversifying and getting into the business of real estate, right? This is a promising new area for for growth, right? So in fact, this kind, this kind of activity, the uncertainty, right, and the and the local proliferation of rules that it generated were part of the CCP's national policy. So let me just show you a little bit of how dramatic this was, what exactly it looked like. So real estate investment, you can see, goes from basically nothing, right, as a share of fixed asset investment, and basically nothing in terms of, um, you know, absolute terms. There was almost no investment in real estate. Real estate was designated as some, like, th tertiary sector, which was only the transaction of these real estate. You know, that's what real estate was. It wasn't a venue for investment. To being a major source of fixed asset investment, right, very quickly, right, in 1992. So this is four years after the land, the, the, the change in the land use law was made, right? And what the difference was, was this was, of course, the period of Deng Xiaoping's southern tour, where he went to Shenzhen, where this was happening in spades, and said, this is a good thing. The state council is issuing these, these um, encouragements for everyone to get into the business of real estate. So this was, again, very much encouraged by national policy. So again, this is fixed asset investment total in this period. We see this was very much, the 1992 period was very much an inflationary bubble. I'll show you some more about that um, in a few minutes. Um, and so interesting things about it, though, is that you know, the, the floor space that was completed by real estate firms is very low right, compared to the floor space that's completed in total. Right? What does that mean? Again, that means that all kinds of enterprises are getting in the business of, 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 of real estate, right? of building these residential and commercial buildings and then selling um, the lease rights, right, to generate money. So, um, and here you see, so the 1992 inflation cycle um, is, is the highest in reform period China, right? Inflation topped over 20%. And you can see a lot of it is being driven by construction, right? By fixed asset um, construction investment rather than by um, you know, consumption. The, so it's a basically a property-driven investment bu inflation bubble rather than, right, a consumption-driven one. So here you have real estate investment to GDP. It, dumps up, it jumps up basically double between 1992 and 1993. And then the rest of the story is something I'm going to tell in just a minute, right? So of course, everything that does come up does go down, right? Where they were wrong. Real estate prices don't just increase without limit and never drop. And they did drop, right? And critically, what happened was um, there were a number of interesting reports done by journalists that showed the sort of spinning out of control of real estate prices. Unfortunately, we don't have any aggregate data on prices and what they looked like across China. China at that time, and for good reason, local governments were trying to hide it, right? But we have anecdotal data, you know, certain complexes in Shanghai um, increasing something like, you know, five times within, you know, the, the year of 1993. And so there are these famous um, 
journalist reports where people went around to find different distortions in prices. And this alarmed uh, members of the Central Committee, right? It alarmed the center in Beijing who thought that real estate was growing, you know, real estate prices were exceeding pr wage growth, um, which may be a social stability problem, and that there were many irrationalities in the real estate market. So they start to tighten the reins on credit, right? So start to tighten what the banks can do. When the banks stop lending, then, right, some of these projects start to come crashing down. So you have all these reports um, in the end of 1993, the beginning of 1994, of all of these different enterprises, again, the very diverse enterprises who got in the business of real estate, who then had to deal with the consequences. So there are nurses and doctors going unpaid because their hospitals, right, have to pay all this money to the bank for their residential housing complex. God forbid professors are going unpaid at this time because the universities were getting involved in some of this stuff, right? So we know that this had major social consequences as well as these macro political consequences. So what do they do? in the aftermath of this. So remember, this is what I call the most liberal period, right? Where these rules, who could get into this market was very diverse, right? Um, who owned land, the, the interpretation of that was very diverse. Um, and so they conclude that that's the problem. The problem is that these things are functioning too close to markets, and what they need is a little macro control, right? So they conclude that the problem is a number of things. First, the barrier to entry to getting into real estate is too low, right? Not every firm should be able to get into the business of enclosing land and leasing out land, right? So as a result, very dramatically, they designate local governments as the representatives of the state. So if the, if the land is, is owned by the state, Goyo, in, the, in, the, in, in urban centers, the local government itself will own that land. And they did this for a number of reasons, but one of them I want to highlight as being, I think, particularly um, interesting and ironic, which is that they wanted to make sure that the owner of urban land was also the person who do, was also the entity who drew up the urban plan, right? So the reason for that is they thought that land would be used more efficiently in that way, right? If you have or if you have owners of land who are not responsible for where the roads go and where the traffic you know flows, then they may make mistakes in terms of what development what development direction the city takes. The other thing is they thought since local governments would rely on leasing out land um, for revenues that they might then have an incentive to use land wisely, right, to lease it out to the highest bidder for the correct purposes, right? And so, of course, in that, they were very, very wrong, right? Um, that it exactly it, it, it sort of generated the opposite incentives, right? But they thought that linking land ownership with urban planning and with reliance on those revenues, right, would generate the right incentives to use land in efficient rather than inefficient ways. Um, so they, you know, there are all these r reports and conferences about how real estate is a special industry, right? It's not like a regular industry of production, right? It can really um, control the, the way the macro economy goes, and the barriers to entry had to be very high. But they don't just change how land is used in China. So they introduce, you know, government ownership, right, but macro supply at the central level. They change a lot of things, right? Um, they have other what I call complementary institutional changes, which happened at the same time. The most famous of which is fiscal recentralization, um, so the tax recentralization of 1994, and the financial recentralization that took place over the rest of the 1990s under Zhu Rongji as he tried to, so one of the problems they thought was this decentralized ownership over banks was generating the wrong incentives and they need to bring bank control back into the hierarchy of the party state in Beijing. So we see this dramatic recentralization. So the dotted line is the central share of total revenues, right, um, as opposed to the local government, and that's everything provincial and below. And so the central, the center, you know, recentralizes control over f over tax revenue. But you can see its share of expenditures, which is in the black line, continues to go down. <laughs> what does that mean? It means that local governments are responsible for the lion's share of expenditures on infrastructure, social services, social programs, public goods, but they have basically no access, right, to um, to tax revenues or less. And, uh, less and less access to tax revenues. Um, so what does that mean? That they rely increasingly on land in the story that we've seen after that. So instead of this being an accidental consequence, this was part of that entire institutional reorganization that happened in the 1990s. There were many reasons why the center wanted to recentralize control over tax revenues, right? But the idea is if you recentralize tax revenues and you assign them something else, and they say this very clearly, land will become a secondary source of income. We can mobilize land as capital for local governments all over China, right? And it'll give them the best incentives to use land wisely, and it'll allow us to do something else with our fiscal system.
Okay, so that's the land and recentralization. That's the answer to the first puzzle. How did this happen? And the second, um, why do they continue to strengthen these mechanisms is because land is used as one of these policy tools um, for economic management in China. So let me just show you this. So this is one of the most interesting graphs I, I ever look at. So you can see, so the, we think of like, business cycles, like the United States has them, right? Everywhere has them, where inflation goes up and then everyone gets happy and then there's a crash, right? Some are bigger than others. So China very much had these inflation bubbles in the first, to say, 12 years of the reform and opening period. And the, the biggest one, as I said, was in 1992. But since then, they don't seem to have business cycles in this way that they had at the beginning of the reform period. Um, and they don't have them in the same way that other capitalist countries or semi-capitalist countries seem to experience them. But the curious thing is if you overlay like interest rates or other basic tools of macroeconomic management, they're not explaining this variation. It's not as if China has now adopted a very serious interest rate policy and that's what's curbing lending, right? It's something else. Um, so of course, this is the consumer price index. So if you look at the property price index, it's a very different story. You definitely see right different kinds of cycles and those are associated not with interest rates and not with central fiscal policy but with changes in the land supply right so um, let me just show you this as um, one piece of evidence of this and then I'll, I'll narrate basically what this looks like for most of the 90s and 2000s with attention to specific episodes so the purple is the real estate growth rate um, so investment in real estate um, the growth in investment in real estate and the and the black is the GDP growth rate right and you see that there are certain episodes so 1998 which I'll, I'll say is the beginning of this right where you start to see the CCP the Ministry of Land Resources the Ministry of Finance right from the top mobilizing increases in the land supply as ways to generate further investment as, as, as a downturn is reached in the macro economy, right? So using land and investment of land counter cyclically to generate aggregate demand, right? It happens again um, very dramatically in 2009 um, in the fiscal stimulus, which I'll talk about in just a moment. So the argument again is that this decentralized ownership over land, but centralized control has allowed the CCP to use this as a tool. So it works, yes. Great, perfect, that's the slide. <laughs> so, um, so it works in three different ways, right? When we think of what, how the, how the, how the, um, how the use of la the, the um, investment in land and real estates actually boosts GDP, right? Or works for GDP. It, maybe you're asking about the quotas, which I'll talk about in just a moment as well, right? So it works in three different mechanisms. So one is direct GDP stimulation through investment, right? So investment is a part of GDP. And so the more you invest in real estate, literally GDP goes up, right? So we see that's like maybe when we think of these ghost cities, right? So if local government officials want to boost GDP by 10%, the best thing to do is to invest a lot of money in real estate, which literally just boosts GDP. These may not be great investments in the long term, Right, but it does boost GDP in the short term. The second way is that it works as a fiscal stimulus for local governments. So again, local governments don't have control over levying their own taxes. Right, They can't go directly um, to bond markets to borrow. The only thing they can really control year to year, month to month, is how much land they're able to lease out um, to generate revenues. And if you want local governments to invest in local economies, so you want stimulus to occur through infrastructure investment or through job generation programs, right? the only way that local governments can get that money to do that is through land leasing. Right, So it works as a fiscal stimulus for local governments. And the mechanism there we see is the use of these quotas so what the central so what the Ministry of Land Resources does it has a quota system you know because ideally all local governments would love to convert as much land as possible every year um, to generate as much land lease revenue as possible but that for various reasons is a bad idea mostly related to food security um, as well as macroeconomic management so instead they set this red line in 2006-2007 of about um, so so it's about 120,000 hectares um, of land that's necessary for agricultural stability, so for you know agricultural security to be able to have arable land. And then every year, there's a certain amount that local governments are allowed to convert, right? And so this, those quotas are basically set through a negotiation process, through hierarchically, through the Ministry of Land Resources. So the Ministry of Land Resources allocates every province a certain amount, and that province then distributes it down that hierarchy, right? So it's a, p a political tool. And unfortunately for us, it's also opaque. We don't know how much those quotas actually are. Um, we, don't we have no centralized data source on that. But they're distributed regionally um, in ways that also suit the CCP's 
objective. The third mechanism is through the financial system, and it's the mechanism of credit expansion. So if you look at um, you know, the, the expansion of loan volume, of how much loans and credit expansion, it doesn't, again, it doesn't correlate to interest rates, right? It correlates to how much land is being converted from rural to urban land and then leased out. So why does that work? Local governments borrow um, through these semi-public and semi-private um, platform companies and investment companies, right, which have the implicit backing of the local government, but they go to the bank and they use land as collateral, right, which means that if you give a certain um, municipality an increased quota in how much land they can convert, that translates directly into how much credit they can get from local, from local banks um, or national banks, right, in order to borrow to do various projects, right. So it's a mechanism of direct GDP um, boosting as well as fiscal and, and, and works through the financial system. Yes? Well, Well, it's about all of them because you can't have growth in a real estate sector, right, for the most part, unless you have access to new land, right, for first for firsthand home sales. That's right. Um, in general, though, it doesn't seem to work that way, right? So, in fact, we find that most of the time when the real estate sector is heating up, right, it's mostly driven through first-hand, so first-time newly constructed homes rather than second-hand or third-hand homes, right? So we know that empirically in China it does work in this direction, right? But the argument that I would make is that it's all tied together, right? And especially, especially the financial part of it, right? Because real estate companies, which tend to be a lot, many of them are associated with local governments themselves, right? They can only get loans whatever kind of projects they're doing based on collateral that they put up and the collateral that they mostly use is land. Whether those pieces of land are tied to the specific project that they're getting you know, a loan for, right, is very different. But in general, it's, it's expanding the quotas in a specific area or overall is like expanding the credit system in China, right, without working through the interest rate channel, right. Okay, so let me just narrate this very briefly. Um, uh, so again, we don't have um, data on these quotas. I have it for a couple of provinces for a couple of years and was able to check it against a number of proxies and it doesn't really work that well, which is unfortunate for um, my ambitions to test the argument quali quantitatively. But in any case, um, I tested it in a different way, which is actually, um, which is to use, um, to an analyze these different episodes. So if I'm right, basically, if I'm right that they're using the aggregate land supply um, as a counter-cyclical way to manage these business cycles, then you would see in periods of downturn um, that they're encouraging more circulation of land and in periods of overheating that they're trying to rein in land development. Um, and so I look then at, at, at these different episodes from 1998 to 2010 and I find exactly that, right? So the first is 1998 is the Asian financial crisis where you know, although China wasn't hit nearly as bad as other countries in the region or even at all, um, the perception was that this was a very damaging moment for China, right, 1998, and that de you know, aggregate demand was going to go down and there were concerns about how to make sure that this didn't hit the real economy. And this was the first time where land, right, and real estate at the same time, but through actually different mechanisms this time, were used to stimulate aggregate demand. So 1998 was famously the first time that the CCP from the center encouraged large-scale um, housing privatization in many cities, right? And the idea is if you privatize housing for cheaper prices, then people <laughs> buy more durable goods, they invest more, right? They're like the sort of consuming middle class um, in, urban city, in, in, China, in urban China. Um, and they also huge, huge amounts of new land assignment, right? So not just through the leasing channel, but through the land assignment channel, which this is like a little bit different with how the land works in China. I won't get too much into it, right? But the idea was they assigned many local governments um, more and more land, right, in hopes that they would lease it out and then encourage them to do so. Then you see all of these government documents enc encouraging local governments to, to lease land only th on markets where they generate revenue rather than by assignment um, for free to local government organs. Right? So this is the first time that they actually employ land in this way. 
And then in 2001 to 2003, we see an entire cycle, right? So 2001 was the burst of the dot-com bubble. This affected China in some ways, right? But mostly, right, the concern was this global downturn would last in China. And so they start to mobilize more and more land. They increase the amount of land available. They encourage local governments who have established land banks, many of whom did land reserves um, in the 1980s and 1990s to start to activate the reserves. So push um, banked land into circulation um, is the way that they talk about it in these documents. Um, so uh, encouraging them to start developing this land to generate aggregate demand in the economy. Um, and then they do this so much, right, that in 2003, 2004, there's a period of overheating and a period of overconversion of land. So once again, the Ministry of Land Resources becomes concerned about agricultural security and about the amount of land being taken over for urban purposes from the rural sector. And so in 2004, there's a moratorium on further development zones. So they go through and check many of the development zones that were declared during the 2001 to 2003 period, and they cancel many of them, um, and they, they place a moratorium on locally designated and approved development zones on, for further notice. Um, the third episode, which is not a temporal episode, right, which is more um, of the regional development programs that I, that I look at over time. So many of you are familiar with some of China's regional development programs like Sibu Da Kaifa, Open the West, or Zhongbu um, Jueqi, the rise of the center, right? So the idea is to target resources and investment in regions of China that have suffered um, relative to the, the, the east coast and the south of China. Um, and you see that the, these big development programs, these big investment programs, they, they do come with a lot of direct investment from the central government, but they also come with increased land quotas, right? So that's very much a part of all of these programs. So the center wants to encourage economic activity. It gives cities like Lanzhou, right, provinces in the west, in the center, in the northeast, more and more land to convert to generate aggregate demand. Um, so we see that that is a part of the way that they want to distribute resources in the macro economy. The fourth episode um, is the creation of the quota system. So this quota system that I was just describing is a product of um, thinking over a long term, but it starts in 2006, right, when the Ministry of Land Resources adopts what it calls the strictest program for managing um, the aggregate supply of land, right? So they were concerned about a number of things, um, mostly related to agricultural security, right? But they create this quota system where land is hierarchically allocated. And they do that the same year that they remove the agricultural tax. So I, I said at the beginning of the talk, right, that this, the peasant burden, they responded to that by eliminating the agricultural tax. So at the same time that they eliminate the agricultural tax, you see discussions about, well, now what will local governments do? They'll have more incentives right, to, to convert land. So in response, right, they further institutionalize this program. Right? They want local governments to continue to be able to convert land, but not without limit right? and not without oversight. Right? So you can start to see these things as sort of double movements. Right? At the same time, they're removing even further sources of budgetary revenue. Right? They're controlling hierarchically the use of land as a source of budgetary revenue. And then the last episode, which um, because of proximity we may all feel quite familiar with, is the response to the 2008 downturn. Um, which So basically from 2004 through 2008, most of the documents of the Ministry of Land Resources are all about limiting land conversion. We've got to stop local governments from creating these false development zones, abusing farmers' rights. And actually, I, I think intellectually it's interesting because the China field starts to pay attention to land at this time. And I would argue that they then misread it, right? Because everyone's interested in land this time and they only see one side of the documents, which are all saying stop these land conversions, they think of the whole thing as something that local governments do and the center government doesn't want them to do, right? But then if you look in 2008, 2009, they start to say again these things about moving land out of land banks, encouraging more land conversion, turning land into capital in order to generate aggregate demand, and the results are well known to us, right? So the stimulus... Um, which was this, you know, this huge amount of stimulus that was declared by Wen Jiabao. Only one-fourth of that stimulus money actually came through central investment. The rest of it came through land quota enhancement, directives to local governments to lend, right, and through the credit system, which again is related to the land system. So only one-fourth. But when you, when you stimulate through a credit system, you can't control the extent of it. And indeed, they didn't, right? So we see investment to GDP climbs to 50 percent um, at the height of that period. It was over 60 percent in some places like Chongqing that really went crazy with the land investment. And the stimulus itself grows to an estimated 27% of GDP, so totally out of control, right? So we see the peak of this land bubble here. Then you start to see all these fears of malinvestment, of ghost cities, and it's at this moment that the CCP basically says, this system won't work anymore, right? We need to find something else. We need to find something else that's not dependent on investment, that's, that's more about demand, something else that will generate um, economic growth. We need to see the maturation of our monetary policy instruments. And so that's why I put 2010 as sort of the, the bookend of this period. 
So let me just talk about the implications for just a moment and then briefly talk about the future. Um, so when we think about land in this way, so again, not as like this hapless thing where the central government is just desperately trying to control local governments from expropriating more and more land. Think about what does it mean when you give a local government a quota? You can develop this much of, of, of land. It means you have to basically take those resources from peasants to expropriate the peasants, right? It can't actually be an accident, right, that the center is provoking local governments to do this, right? They're not that stupid. They know exactly what's going to happen. So instead of seeing this, right, as some like hapless thing, I see it more as a, a principal agent game. And it's not a perfect, they're not, per the, the local governments are not perfect agents of the centers. Of course, they're doing things like that the center doesn't want them to do. It's not a perfect system, right? But it's one that's intentionally controlled in this way by Beijing. And we think about the role of land. Um, so it's interesting, you know, jihua is not, you know, jingji jihua, economic planning, that's not a term you see very frequently in China now, but guihua you see all the time, right? The NDRC, um, the National Development Reform Commission, like all of of the, the big agencies for planning in the Chinese economy use this term guihua, and it really means about land planning rather than economic planning. So again, there's not planning through these micro mechanisms of price or controlling quotas of how much is produced or consumed, right? But, but, but land planning and urban planning as a way to do economic planning. So almost every city in China, they'll tell you, look at our plan, we're going to develop in this direction. This is, this is how they think, right? Land development and real estate and development and construction is how they imagine, right, the future of economic economic development in their cities, right? So from Jihua to Guihua as a form of intervention in the economy. And again, this conflict benefits the center, which is a, a pattern that's pretty well known in Chinese politics. So uh, you know, there are maybe 65% of these mass incidents are from, are from land grabs, but they're all thought of as locally. So I saw you do that, that the picture of Wukan, right? And they're holding this banner, and the banner says, we the people of Wukan humbly beseech the center to help us with our problem, right? So the idea is that this land, this conflict between peasants and local governments, right? It's endemic, to, it's, a, it's a natural part of this system, right? But it's one that the CCP can definitely control, and even benefit from um, in this way. So yes, it provokes all of this problem, but the problem isn't a threat to the system itself. It's cellularized and it still permits this land-driven growth. So I think of these things as what we might think of as the institutional complementarities. That's like a term from the varieties of capitalism, literature, and political science of Chinese capitalism. This fiscal system, the financial system, and the land system work together to produce a certain type of Chinese capitalism right? that has dominated at least um, through the present. So the question then is, what is the future? Um, and I'll talk about this for just a couple of minutes and then um, allow you to ask questions. So, um, so this, um, you can see I've gotten I've produced this table based on a couple of documents. One um, is a document that's about new style, Xin Xin Cheng Zhen Hua, um, new, style, new style urban planning um, that, was, uh, that was released in March of 2014. This is the Li Keqiang big plan for urbanization as the driver of Chinese growth in the next century. And the other is from a publication that's joint between the DRC and the World Bank, which we might also think of as a semi-official publication, right? So it's interesting. The answer to this, this period of over-investment over in urban construction, how well would they rectify this and then generate an economy that works based on domestic demand? The answer is also urbanization, right, but in a different way, right? Urbanization in a way where land is not urbanized faster than people, right? But we first, but it's, uh, you, so people are urbanized, they become real urban citizens, right? So in, in fact, their citizenship is normalized. So we call it, we, there's all these references to um, the, 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 the citizen, citizenshipification, right, of migrant labor, right? So in previously, people moved to cities and then they they would remit their earnings to the countryside, right? They couldn't invest in cities. This was a major depressor of consumption in China. So this will change, right? So you can see all of these projections. Um, it, so urbanization is basically the solution to these problems. At the same time, it was a cause of some of these problems. Um, so then we see the ghost cities, right, in a different light. Um, so in some ways, right, th so of course Ordos will always be a ghost city, <laughs> in my view, right? There are some places in China where this investment will basically always look like a museum to a bad way of making decisions and allocating resources, right? But this looks sort of different, right? And the argument is, if they're going to urbanize a massive amount of people from the countryside and normalize urbanization, right, migration for a massive amount of people who are already in Chinese cities, they're going to do it in a way where the CCP and local governments will control the pace and direction of migration. And so why do they want to do that? Um, they want to do that because they don't want it to look like this, right? So if you're going to urbanize hundreds of millions of people, other countries have done that, right? Brazil has done that, Kenya has done that, India has done that, right? But they do it in ways that are threatening um, to what the CCP would think, right? They, you know, when you see 
um, you know, mass urbanization, you start to see mass social and political demands, right? But if the idea is you can first provide housing, first provide infrastructure for these people, and then urbanize them, right, something different will happen. Um, so I talk about um, construction-driven urbanization. So this new plan of urbanization is having these three different goals. One is macroeconomic control, so reversing this overinvestment, and then when you generate, you know, this permanent urban class to start um, generating domestic demand. They feel secure enough um, that they start, you know, spending money again on durable goods, on various other things, to manage the pace um, of urbanization and migration, and also to develop possibilities for agricultural agglomeration and agribusiness, which I can talk about in more detail. But um, but I, I do want to talk about um, just this, like this, this conclusion, right? So a lot of people talk about this new urbanization in China, the new land reforms, which I'm happy to talk about in some detail, as China's enclosures moment, referencing this movement in England, you know, where the countryside was turned from the commons into private land holdings, and the people who didn't get land moved to the cities to become basically the working class, um, who also actually agitated for redistribution and democratization, right? So I would argue that this is exactly the opposite. That China wants this to be exactly the opposite of the enclosures, right? That it's not a privatization of land in rural China. In fact, it's a reconstitution of state control over rural land and urban land in China. Um, so that's not the right analogy. I also hope that the Great Leap Forward and Stalin's population movements are not the right analogy, um, but I, I suppose only time can tell that in the next few decades. So thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Um, just a real quick question. Um, in the areas of, of these major urban cities where <coughs> they're destroying these old neighborhoods, mm -hmm. have they already started to maybe move some of the people who are being displaced into these uh, phantom or already constructed empty, um, shells and buildings? Yes. Um, so, I mean, it's not so, so part of that is from um, what goes on in, in cities when they relocate urban residents, which I, I know a lot about how that happened before 2010, um, just because that's what I was doing research on. But since 2010, I don't know a lot about that process. I have been doing research on the process where they move rural citizens into those different places. So there are all these new programs on what's called quota linking. So it's very, it's really very interesting. Um, so you take, you know, rural, so a, a migrant, you know, a village is here and people live on different land here, here, and here. And you move them into the city, but no one wants to develop this rural land way out in the middle of nowhere. So you turn that back into arable land, which means your quota is unaffected. <laughs> and then you can still develop land next to the urban center for doing that. And so the impact of that is to move lots of peasants, farmers, into high-rise housing. It's called going upstairs in Chinese. You know, we're got, the whole village is going to move upstairs, move into these high-rise houses. And, um, you know, the implications of that are kind of amazing in a number of different ways, right? So one is you have a new class of, you know, ur of, of in situ urbanized um, rural dwellers who are now sort of urban, who don't necessarily work the land, but don't necessarily have urban jobs. And I mean, it's funny, everyone in the China field is publishing all these articles on how all these people are really angry and, you know, all this. And I, you know, I find, yeah, some people are really angry. Other people are just like, well, my house now has a toilet. And so they're not angry. And I mean, so uh, the, the interesting thing is, like, everything in China, it's happening very differently in different places. Um, so some, some, rural, some county governments and municipal governments are doing this in a way that involves a lot of voice and decision and agency on the part of, of local, of rural dwellers. And other places, it's more of a forced migration. And so looking at that variation, I think, is a very promising avenue of research. Um, but it's certainly... I mean, when we think, and then, you know, the other thing that we're seeing a lot of is, like, very of concentrated housing for new urbanites, which anyone familiar with, like, the history of public housing in the United States and um, cities in Western Europe, you feel nervous about that, right? There's something that can be very um, socially risky um, in concentrating large amounts of, um, of, you know, lower class residents um, who maybe don't have the same socioeconomic connections, right, in, in certain buildings. So the risk of concentrated poverty, I think, are a is a huge one. Thank you. Sure. Yes, Mary. So I have a question about um, the last part of the talk because this seems like a really critical issue for um, for whether or not this will be successful or whether or not you know these people who are in these um, new high rises will revolt at some point. Where are these people going to be working? Like, what yeah. is the employment plan for people who are going to be moving into the city or or moving into high rises and not working the land anymore? I mean, I know a little bit about it from the labor side, but mm -hmm. I don't. Exactly. So that I would say there's like, yeah, so let me, I guess there's like bad news, good news, and bad news. So the bad news is 
there's no discussion of that so far. Um, the good news is, so there's no, I mean, and this is a real risk. So, I mean, I've written something with Kristen Looney who works on um, the rural modernization side and, and like we, and, and we've been concerned about, um, you know, urbanization without jobs. So like it used to be, you know, urbanization without citizenship and now it may be urbanization with citizenship i.e. and demands on social welfare systems without employment or like training for employment. The good news is, um, these two documents, which I was, uh, which I used to create the table, so the the Xinxin Xiang Zhenhua and the the Urban China Report, have extensive recommendations for like skills programs, all these kinds of things, and so and the, so all of this, like these are projections, but they're projections with reforms. And the reforms are like a very detailed suite of reforms that I didn't go into here that have to do with how capital, land, and labor are allocated in China. So the good news is they have that kind of plan. But the bad news, again, is that they haven't made any progress on those reforms because they're only doing an anti-corruption campaign in China and nothing else, right? So, um, so there's like, the good news is I think they want like some thinking in terms of that direction, but, the, but they, haven't they haven't done any of this yet. Um, so it's still kind of pie in the sky stuff, but I agree that it's like, I mean, this kind of, there's a reason why most massive interventions in population and migration for, on behalf of states have ended badly, right? And this, like, you know, the fact of, um, you know, migrate, you know, forced migration, which is basically what this is, and, and particularly this part of the plan, which is um, emphasizing small towns and small cities versus big cities. Well, why do migrants want to go to big cities? Well, that's where the jobs are, right? So if you want to send them to smaller cities, then the state has to do something to generate that kind of employment. Um, and, you know, I, I hope that they figure that out if they indeed implement some of these reforms, but we'll see. Yes, man. Yes. Um, so I very much think it's an intentional thing on the part of the central government. And like, is it by that? Do I mean like in 1993 did Zhao Ziyang create a conspiracy to do it, or you know, or did um, you know some or some you know Zhuangji think this up? No, right. But these kinds of. But it's not as if this is an accident, right? The center knows what it's doing when it tells a local government it has a certain amount of quota. And then all I see in these documents, right, especially if you look at documents outside of this period of 2004 through 2008, which is when everyone looks at the documents, right, is very much encouraging encouraging this kind of land development, right, as a way to generate GDP. They use all this amazing language about it, right? So the land supply is called the jiamen, the sluice gates of the economy, right? So controlling up and down, right, how much investment happens, right? So they very much use this language of macro control and as an instrument of macro adjustment. That's how they talk about it. Um, in terms of whether you see that kind of counter-cyclical increases in the quota, Again, unfortunately, we don't have large-scale data on the quotas, right? I can't look at the quotas. I mean, what I would love to do is look at places where there's localized downturns. So when we think about, like, so the, the downturn in global demand, right, that affected the southeast coast, right, where we see massive amount of unemployment. If I'm right, you would expect to see massive increases in the amount of land quotas that were generated there. But we don't have that kind of data, so we just don't know. We can look at the amount of land that's actually... Um, so the amount of newly added construction land, and it does follow this pattern, right? So whatever local governments do, it does follow. So even in the aggregate, right, we start to see, um, you know, the amount of land leased, right, is exactly countercyclical. So it goes way up in 2001 and down in 2003 and then way up in 2008, 2009 and then down again. Yeah. I think that's of course part of the dynamic as well, right? And like anything, like any instrument of macro control, it's imperfect, right? I mean, it's basically Bernanke can like print money all he wants. He can't tell us what to do with it, right? So, and you know, Janet Yellen can like you know continue to not raise interest rates, but she can't tell us to invest in the right things or right not to borrow too much, right? So. In general, it's a tool. It's an imperfect tool, right? But this, I, I feel like this, this narrative that we have in the China field that the local governments are really doing things and the center just can't control them from doing that. 
I actually think the central government is pretty powerful on ma on many of these issues, right? Any government that can re-centralize control over tax resources in like w in like one month, right, can probably do something. If it really wants to control what local governments are doing and stop them from that, then it will do that. But in fact, I think what they think is that, you know, this is a, a driver of investment that, in fact, urbanization has to happen in China. But in the dynamic is that, I mean, when you think about, you know, when I think about the comparative literature, like why do states adopt different tools, right? It's about the political coalition. Well, if you think about the political coalition that's benefited by this land tool, central government, local governments, um, public business, right? So the state-owned sector, state-owned real estate developers, private real estate developments, and who loses? Small-scale private sector and peasants, aka no one cares about them, right? So like that, that's, uh, like that, that's the political coalition that's never had to be satisfied in China. Um, so at least that's that's my read of it. I think it is a controversial way of thinking of it, um, and there are lots of counter arguments, and you know, so I'm happy to hear them, but thanks. Can you take the Chinese maybe one more question? Sure, yes. So um, the Chinese disinvolvement in hacking is using them at least in the, the mandate for the national economy for a long period of time and across a wide range of areas. So I'm just wondering if you observe like variation either alongside or across areas or other dimensions. I'm not sure I really understand the question. So, like there's like different parts, right? Uh -huh. There is financial yeah. part, there is a quota system, right. there is some other like administrative tools they can do this. Mm -hmm. Do you observe like variations in terms of this instrument? Oh, that's a good question. I'm, I haven't looked in a concentrated way at that, but one thing I would like to emphasize is that like a lot of the things, like how, it, you know, credit works in China in general, a lot of it ha does have to do, right, with political directives and statements, right? So um, so I don't want to get too bogged down in, like, the quota as this technical tool with which they exactly do it, right? It also is, like, the tone of government documents and of government um, and of central government leaders when they say things, right? So if you look at, like, the speeches of the Minister of Land Resources over time, right, they'll give these political directives to move, again, to circulate land, move it out of land banks. The, the new, you know, the new policy work style is to encourage land development. You know, the past, and they'll say things like this, the past four years have been reigning in land development, and now it's time to encourage land development, right? So a lot of it works through a softer channel than just those mechanisms that I was actually showing you, the softer channel of political directive and political encouragement rather than just the technical stuff. Um, but I haven't looked, again, systematically at what mechanisms and what channels take precedent over what time. That'd be an interesting way to expand the research agenda in the future. Thank you for all your attention. I really appreciate it. Thank you.